Hey, I'm joined again by Trina Reed, and we're going to talk about Ovid and about looking at a couple of the stories from Ovid's Metamorphoses that was that were appealing to Trina. Trina is not only a poet, so she could look at these through some fresh and interesting eyes. But she's also a novelist and story writer, uh, so she also can bring a storyteller's eyes to these and which ones are appealing to her and why. We'll talk a little bit about um, why these stories resonate with her, maybe why these stories resonate over the centuries and thousands of years. Um, and so uh, why don't we just get right into it okay. and uh, what I, I would love before we even get into specific stories, your general impression of Ovid. Uh, well I had a couple um, first of all, it's a, uh, it's pretty intense. I mean, it's, it's not for the light of heart. And not right. for, you have to be prepared when you go in. It's going to be, it's going to be a bumpy ride and right. a crazy ride. That's I right. think that um, it's really interesting. It's kind of like, if you looked at it in a modern sense, I mean, I know it's really old and it's myth, but it's also world building. So mm -hmm. it's this, um, they start at the beginning of time and then they go up to, well, his present time. And so the first, so the first stories are about the gods and the goddesses and how they make more gods and goddesses and mm -hmm. all the things that happen there, mm -hmm. the good, the bad, and the ugly, mostly the, la the latter. Right. <laughs> and then I also found it really interesting that since, of course, metamorphoses means that they are changing. Right. Mostly they change into things of nature. And I found it really interesting that the they could be turned into a tree for many reasons. And some of them were punishment. And some of them were because they were asking the gods to help them and to save them. And the same exact action is done for both of those things. Right. For punishment and for saving. So I love that. I love that idea because um, when we think of the story of Daphne and Apollo, where she doesn't want him, she's repulsed by him because Cupid has right. pierced uh, Apollo's heart with a love arrow and pierced her heart with a a unlove, a rep you know repel arrow. She absolutely doesn't want him. So when she's calling, she's when she's pleading for help, she gets help all right, but it's almost I'm kind excited. of a punishment as yeah. well. Um, I love that idea. I, I hadn't but thought of that. Too. But if you think about it this way, when we look at um, our actions in our own lives, sometimes the things we feel are punishments maybe really are answers and um, vice versa. So I think that it's not just in over that this happens. I think that it's in life and, and we feel that same thing if you think about um, our relationship to God as their relationships to the gods too. We kind of feel the same sometimes. Right. So one of the things I think in dealing, you know, in looking at the difference between, say, the Christian God, our God, and these very human-like gods of the Greeks and the Romans, and even going back to Gilgamesh, one of the, if you want to look at an evidence of God's uh, benevolence, mm. look no further than the fact that God often doesn't answer our prayers, whereas the gods were, are happy sometimes to answer our prayers. And take great delight in knowing that this isn't what you really want. But I'll I'm give just, it to you. I'm going to give it to you and tough on you. Yeah, I like that. Um, and so, they're very, they're very much in the image of the people who created them. You can definitely see our own struggles in the gods and goddesses' struggles. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's, I mean, of course, they're writing about how did our world come about and what did this look like and, well, I mean, maybe. Ovid in specific wasn't, but the myths in general certainly right, were. Right, that's right. And he's certainly putting his own spin on Ovid. <laughs> but, um, and I hate to put you on the spot with this question, but, you know, when we look at these stories and we see that the people create, you know, you know, creating the gods in their own image, is it really so, so out there to imagine that we do the same? Oh, not even close. Yeah, we uh, do. Um, but that doesn't mean, so I definitely think that we do, but that doesn't mean that we don't, There, those things aren't also part of who God is. Mm -hmm. So for example, I may see 
in creating in my own image, if you want to talk about it in that way, I may see a different aspect of God than, than you do because I bring all my baggage. We bring all of mm -hmm. our stuff and God does speaks to us and works with us in different ways. So when we say we create God in our own image, sometimes that's really bad. I mean, that can be super bad and right. that happens too, but sometimes it's not a bad thing. And I think in eternity, when we um, talk about who God is, we will show him we will show people who we saw who he was. Oh, and so nice. in that way, you could say, it's not always a bad thing to see God through your eyes because we don't really have any other choice, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yes, yeah, so in the good sense and in the bad sense, we definitely create mm -hmm. our own gods, and, uh, God in our own image. Now, as somebody who has some experience in doing your own world building, I like that you use that word that, mm -hmm. that Ovid's doing some world building, which is what we think of when we think of somebody creating a work of fiction or fantasy. Uh, or fantasy because this really is a, a very early fantasy uh, novel in some ways. Um, what do you think of Ovid's ability to world build? Well, I find it really interesting because he's not actually like in some senses he's creating something brand new because he's taking all these myths that have happened or that have been told and retold already mm -hmm. and he's linking them together and right. hooking them together mm -hmm. and sometimes those links are really good and sometimes they're a little off i think that um that like this is actually i haven't read a ton of mythology this is well i've read most of i'm not all the way through but i've read most of of it and I find it they're pretty like the gods are pretty consistent, but you don't get to know all of them very well. Mm -hmm. Like some of them are just a little snippet here and a little snippet there. And I guess if you were to research into them, you could find a little bit more. Um, but some of them are you really get to know, right? <laughs> like the big ones, right? You Jove, get to, man, you get to know him and his wife, yeah, you even, get, whether you want to or not, right? That's right. You get to know the big Olympian gods. Right, and I think that they do a really good job. And then the rest of them kind of just fill out. I know they would call it a pantheon, but we're talking about this world. They fill out this world of gods and goddesses. Mm -hmm. and, and in and actually, I find it interesting that in Metamorphosis, um, they tell us about the nature in their world by how things are who they turn things into. Mm -hmm. So, for example, they talk about specific trees, and maybe this is why this tree is like this, or this is why this flower is like this. And so they actually tell us about the flora and the fauna of the place through their myth building. That's very good, very good. Now, um, I, I asked Trina to pick out a couple stories that especially appeal, appealed to her, which is really a mean thing to ask in this short amount of time. Um, but she has done so. And so I want to pull these up here. And uh, the first one that, that, that we're going to pull up here is just an image of it here, is the, uh, the one of Pyramus and Thisbe, which is found in book four. And what is it about this story? It's kind of a sad story that appeals to you. Well, I think the thing that I found really interesting in it is that it's really Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I'm reading the story and I'm like, hey, I know the story, but I don't know it in this way. And and mm -hmm. I'm like, I see what you did there, Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And I really like that. I think that he he took this tiny story and um, expanded it. And there's a lot of examples of that, but this one really struck me because I, I I wasn't aware of it before. I think it's, and of course we know, as I've mentioned uh, in other places, that Ovid is really the source material for much of Shakespeare. But it, this gives us a picture in how Shakespeare worked. Because you know he's he's got this simple source story uh, that is itself tragic, and he's going to amp that up because I because <laughs> I you know I find it a sad story, but I don't feel depressed for a week like I do with <laughs> Romeo and Juliet. Um, the uh, and even before Shakespeare's time, though, artists like this wonderful Danish painter have been. Uh, pulling from Ovid and I, I, I even wonder if Shakespeare is a move by the art. Well if you look at this picture uh, I mean this could just as well be called Romeo and Juliet. That's true. I mean it's the same image. Romeo has passed away and Juliet has found him dead and is killing herself with the sword. Right. I mean it's the it's a it could be either one. It's the same story same story and uh, the uh, 
it's remarkable actually. So I just love it because it does give us kind of an idea into how the great mind of Shakespeare works. But it also is how mythology evolves. I mean, this is this is how Cinderella evolves. I mean, just mm -hmm. the next person takes it and puts their spin on it. And and this is how Beauty and the Beast evolves. This is how all of our stories evolve until somebody sets it down, gives it an oral, or moves it from an oral, we'll say loosey goosey uh, life into a very in stone, set in stone story. A story. Yeah. Um, and I, I, that's very popular now, retelling of um, fairy tales. Mm -hmm. uh, I, maybe we should start the retelling of Ovid. Although they're all, mm -hmm. most of them are very sad. So. Right, it's difficult for it's <laughs> difficult for me to imagine there's any no, of them. There's not a lot of happy ever after. Yeah, I don't I don't imagine any of them as particularly good uh, Disney mm -hmm. animated right. features. But the next story that you really liked was this one right here, and uh, which is Arathus Arathusa's uh, account here, where. Uh, She's going to, Chris, going to get turned into something rather odd. Uh, what appeals to you about this? Well, I like. I think that the what really struck me. Well, first of all, in this example, like I talked about before, this is early on, and this is a, actually a nymph. It's not a person. Mm -hmm. It's a nymph, one of the like minor gods, kind of like right. if you would think about it in that way. And um, so it's. She is running away, as often is the case, by um, this guy who is, because they were all beautiful, They're like all... so beautiful, and the men wanted them, of and course. And the men were, and the men were horny. Right? And so this is actually an example of, she's like, oh, please save me, and the goddess Diana turns her into a fountain. You're welcome. Right. This is a good example of the answer to her prayer is a kind of punishment. Um, I mean, I, I always wonder, were they actually thankful? I mean, this woman, I mean, she's no longer a woman. Now she's a fountain, um, right. which is eternal. It goes on. Uh, theoretically, she goes right. on and on. She goes and, on. And being a nymph, she goes on and on. And she was part of the water originally anyway, so maybe it's just a... But it is really interesting. Um, I think, like I said, I just, I found it bizarre. I mean, it was bizarre enough that things, people were turned into trees and cows and stags and mm. all these things. But a fountain struck me as very, very strange. Well, and I've often wondered if uh, with something like this, it makes you look at every fountain differently. <laughs> Suddenly you're like, I wonder, this was this, that a nymph one? Was this really a nymph? When I'm walking in the sunken gardens here in Lincoln, and there's some really beautiful sculpture in there, I wonder. Right. Mm, maybe this was a real, real person or a nymph or something like that. And ah, alas, now they're stuck here in that, you fountain. know, skin, as a fountain. Um, well, the one statue is named Rebecca, and she's continually pouring water from her jar. So I feel like that's some kind of metaphor. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And the last one is one that's interesting. It strikes me as interesting that you talked about this one. Um, and this is the Venus and Adonis myth. And, um, and a lot of people like to focus on the tragic end of Adonis because he is mortal. Uh, but you uh, focus rather on, on Venus, the goddess of love, because she would be Aphrodite in the Greeks. So she's one of the most powerful goddesses. I mean, she's one of the, the big seven uh, Olympian gods. What is it that appeals to you about this story? Well, I actually, I like it because this is one of the rare stories, if you don't go on to read part two. This, don't read part two. Don't, <laughs> that is actually has a happy ending. And I don't mean they escaped by being turned into a cow. That doesn't seem happy to me. Mm -hmm. This one actually has a happy ending. So Venus is super fast, apparently. Faster than all the men, gods or men, just in general. Super, she's a runner. Which, by you, the way, I can say that because love moves quickly. That's the, it's the, ah. So she's the goddess of love and being the goddess of love. Love moves fast. So that's why she's so fast. I see. Okay. And so 
she, there was this, if you beat me in a, a foot race, then I will marry you. And nobody could, of course. And of course, Venus never wanted anybody to. She's like, men, who needs them? Right. right? Not me. I mean, come on. And all these, these men tried and I, and I think something really, I think they died if they didn't. Either you got the girl or you died. Right. That was the answer. That was it. Usually that's it. And apparently she was worth it. Clearly. Yeah. And so finally, this man, Adonis, comes along and she is thinking to herself, I'm not sure I want to win. I don't, I, she's running along. And of course, she saw him and she, because he was with the group and she's like, oh, I hope he doesn't do it because I don't want him to die. Right. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, I, I really, I really don't want him to win. But she's, she is a girl of integrity. I also mm -hmm. like this about her. And she's like, but I'm not just going to let him win. I'm going to still try my hardest, even though I would be sad. And even though I don't want him to die. And uh, there, of course, was a um, interference with, uh, from another god. I don't remember which one, but there was this interference, which there always is, because that's many of the points of the stories. And they tripped her up, and they distracted her, and they kept her from winning the race. And so in the end, Adonis won the heart and the hand. And the goddess. That's right, of Venus. Yeah. Now, one of the things, and I think that that helps us illustrate something about the myths in general. One is, of course, you, you just making that comment about how uh, the gods themselves are really personifications of something that's very real. Mm. So, for example, uh, Venus being the goddess of love, uh, Aphrodite, same goddess uh, in Greek, being the goddess of love, so she's really, it's like thinking of the idea of love and, and giving it a, per, a personhood. Uh, so it's personifying uh -huh, right. it. And which is why she's actually often one of the cruelest gods. Mm. Because love is cruel. But I tell you what, sometimes when she does decide to, to be kind to you, then she is the Very sweetest sweet of it. She is, a, she is the sweetest of the gods because love is like that. Um, and I think that that's true when we think of Mars, the god of war, uh, kind of a ferocious god. Um, but how interesting that Venus and Mars often have their little relationship mm. as well, love and war. Love and war, right? Um, I mean, the whole Helen and the ships and the... Right. Uh -huh. But these stories as well, um, and I don't, I certainly, I don't, I don't think Ovid believes any of these stories. I don't think he believes in the gods. He's still a little too cynical, a little too sarcastic <laughs> to actually believe. But I think he is delighting in the fact that these stories, kind of like, um, oh, parables, if you will, yeah. are actually illustrating something that is quite real. And I like that too. Because when you talk about the personification, it's not just the gods and goddesses. This is what I was, you articulated much better than I did. When they're talking about the types of trees and the types of flowers, they're saying this type of tree and this type of flower is this because of this. I mean, mm -hmm. it's actually a personification of those by saying this was once a person and this is what the person mm -hmm. was like and now it's become this. Right. All of it is like and, that. And I, and I, because I, and I don't think Ava believes in the muses, for example, that there are these goddesses that can touch you with divine creativity. But anybody who's bad. felt, I know, it's too bad, <laughs> but anybody who's felt that burst of creativity, that, mm. that wow moment, can understand why you would personify that as being touched by some divine being. Right. Um, and... So we can look at these myths in a number of ways. And this is the way I think Ovid is, Ovid is opted to treat them, not as seriously as even Homer. I think Homer uh, takes the gods more seriously than, than Ovid does, than, uh, than those who would actually visit temples and give sacrifices. I, something tells me oh, it's not that kind of a person, but rather that he sees the larger truth of these stories and who these gods are. And in some ways, I think that makes the stories worth reading. Mm. 
I think um, obviously Shakespeare did not believe in sure. these gods, but quotes from Ovid 10 times more than any other uh, work of mythology. The only thing he actually does quote from more is the Bible. Mm. Um, and, and it's because he sees a larger truth. Yeah. He's going to tell the, the story of Pyramus and Thisbe in part because it's telling a larger truth that sometimes love, there isn't a happy ending. And love doesn't win. Right. Unlike the Hallmark movies, which I love, love doesn't always win. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes the God of War wins instead of the God of Love. That's right. That's right. So, like that would be an example. Like in Shakespeare's, or even in this, it's the this battle between can our families get together? Is this war going to? Uh, is our love going to exceed or make the war stop? And that obviously was not the case. Right. Sad but true. Absolutely. So I love that about the myths a great deal, and and that's how I think we as Christians can revel in these mm -hmm. stories. Not in any way concerned that I'm going to suddenly believe in Zeus or Jupiter or Apollo because I don't think that's really a risk. <laughs> but I could revel in a larger truth that's being spoken here. And ultimately, that it's giving you little incomplete bits of something that we believe that is true. And that is this great story. And anyway, thank you, Trina. I really appreciate your insight as a poet and, and a writer of fiction and just really appreciate that. And, um, and I have a question for you at the end of this, and I'd love for you to answer that. So thank you so much. Thanks, Trina. Sure.